Yeah. I'd rather clean up the hold after a long weekend. Yeah, yeah. You drink for a month. I'd rather mend every hole in Abba's sails. <laughs> and probably sew your hands together in the process. Yeah. I would rather wrestle a swordfish. Just get in the water with it? I meant on the hook. But I'd snatch it out of the water with my bare hands if it meant not spending a night with these people. You know, it has a sword on its face, right? We lucked out, brother. Planting this field while the others tried to keep up with Rabbi and Sikar. <laughs> it wasn't luck. He chose us. You're going two thumbs deep? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rows three hundreds apart. So why do you think he did that? We're good workers. And maybe he knows we don't like Samaritans. Maybe Jesus just likes us best? Yes, that must be it. So why do you think he likes me best? For the same reasons I like you best. You pose no threat to anyone, intellectually or physically. Thank you, brother. Wait a second. What I want to know is who are we planting this for? He said it would feed generations. I assume travelers, people passing through like us. Hospitality isn't just for those with homes, John. <laughs> Don't quit your day job. It's too late for that. <laughs> Yeah, me too. Come on, let's pick it up. I don't want to lose this job. I would rather talk with Matthew for a whole minute. I'd rather listen to Andrew's jokes. <laughs> Luke chapter 9, we're going to look at verses 51 through 56. Iro, thank you for leading all of those who led us in worship today. That was outstanding. Well, uh, as we saw this clip here, just kind of a reminder, we are starting a new series, and it's from the Chosen series, that there's a couple of ways for you to be able to watch this, and I want to encourage you to do so. Uh, you can go to the Chosen website, or you can download their app, uh, and as a way to do this, this is a second season, and I have uh, said this before, but I'll, I'll repeat it. In my, in my lifetime, probably like many of you, I have seen plenty of Jesus movies, by far. This is the best Jesus movie I have ever seen, and I actually more like a mini-series. Uh, it portrays Jesus in a way that is compelling. He is compassionate. He's loving. He's the kind of person that you would want to follow. So for the next several weeks, we're going to be going through each uh, episode in season two and uh, drawing from some information there to help us in our growth in, in Christ. And so Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 56, I, I'm going to start out with a question this morning. What... Do you hate? Now, I know that's a strong word to say in church, so, but I, I'm going to help you a little bit. What do you hate? Is it broccoli or Brussels sprouts? Uh, maybe I, I, I'll take you a little further. You, you'll relate with this. And is, is it Houston traffic? Am I hitting home? Am I getting a little bit better? All right. Or let's go a little deeper here with Houston traffic. Is it, is it when, the, when the lane is narrowing from wider to smaller and it's those people who try to get in at the very last minute? Am I, are you relating with me now? Am I getting closer to your emotions? Okay. Or is it people who are texting while they're driving? You're at I-10, it's going about 60 miles an hour, you look over and you got somebody going like this. Or is it robocalls? Have I hit the mark on anything here? All right, so what is it we hate? The next question I want to ask you, and really where we're going to land here today, is who is it do you hate? Who do you hate? Now, I know we're in church, and so it might be better if I phrased it this way. Who is it that you strongly dislike? Who is it that, that, that you find difficulty being around, thinking about, or challenged with? So, so today we're, we're introduced, actually in the first season we're introduced to the, the brothers, James and John. This uh, scene was one that we'll connect with here in just a little bit, but this is James and John plowing up a field that Jesus has asked them to do so to plant some seed for an individual. James and John uh, are in Jesus' inner circle. Jesus has his 12 disciples, and then he has his inner circle of three, and that is Peter and these two brothers, James and John. 
it tells us in Mark chapter 3, verse 17, that Jesus chose not to call them always James and John. Let me read the scripture to you. It says, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, in other words, their father was Zebedee, but Jesus nicked, nicknamed James and John the sons of thunder. Let's just probably say that together. He called them what? Sons of thunder. When I, when I think about James and John as sons of thunder, immediately I go to like these guys with leather jackets and a patch on the back that says sons of thunder. And uh, maybe they're riding a camel that's kind of noisy, you know, like a Harley or something. I don't know. But, but Jesus says that he nicknamed, that Jesus nicknamed these guys the sons of thunder. The passage that we're about ready to read is going to give us indication of why he chose to call James and John sons of thunder. So let's look at Luke chapter 9. Starting in verse 51, it says, As the time drew near for him, Jesus, to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead to a Samaritan village to prepare for his arrival. But the people of the village did not welcome Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem. When James and John saw this, they said to Jesus, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven to burn them up? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and so they went to another village. Now, I want you to think about what they just said. Here, here are, here's Jesus' inner circle. Here is the foundation for the early church. And when the Samaritans did not welcome Jesus in, they look at Jesus and say, we have the power to burn all of them up. Jesus, do you want us to do this? They were the sons of thunder. So, so here's, here's a big question. So they're in, a Samaritan, they're in a Samaritan village. It says they're not accepted. And then James and John just get so upset, said, so you burn them all up. So the first question you and I have to ask is, what's the deal with Jews and Samaritans? So let me just give you a little bit of background. So the first king of Israel is Saul, second king is David, and then we have David's son, Solomon. After Solomon, there, become, there comes a division in the nation of Israel, and you have the northern kingdom, which is called Israel, you have the southern kingdom, which is called Judah. The northern kingdom has 10 tribes of Israel. The, the, the southern, Judah, has two. So the kingdom becomes divided, and there's lots of reasons behind that. But the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, finds itself with terrible, awful kings. Every king that comes along leads them further and further away from worshiping the one true God. They, they begin to bring in idol worship. They begin to neglect the temple. All of these kind of things begin to happen. And so to back up a little bit from a sermon series we had not too many weeks ago, in the book of Daniel, we read about the captivity that took place for the nation of Israel. So this is when a foreign nation has come in and taken them captive, took them out of their homeland, and held them as captives for 70 years. So in the midst of that captivity in 722 BC, Assyria comes in and takes captive the, the kingdom of Israel. And in that process, what they do is they bring in foreign people to integrate with, the, with, the, with Israel at this time, and they bring in more foreign gods, and they bring in more false worship, and then the people began to intermarry. And so because of that, the nation of Judah, they are just like, this can't happen. These are not purebred Jews anymore. They've, they've sacrificed their values, their morals, their relationship with God. They've pushed all of this aside. And so starting 550 years before this incident, 550 years, Jews started hating Samaritans for all sorts of various reasons, but there was great hate in between them. So here's James and John, a couple of good Jewish boys. They grew up in their home, probably without question, they grew up being told that you were to hate Samaritans. Hate them because of their background for whatever, but they were told probably by their father, and he was told by his father, and he was told by his father, 550 years they have hated one another. And most likely, James and John didn't really know why. They were just told, 
you hate Samaritans. Let me, let me help a little bit. So I grew up in Oklahoma. You guys know that. And I grew up being told that Texas Longhorn fans were difficult. They were rude. They were obnoxious. And they were sore losers. I, I grew up hearing that. Nine years ago, I moved to Texas. And I have discovered that that is not completely true. They're not everything I was told when I, when I grew up. Let's go a little bit more serious. Is there a group of people that when you grew up in your home, you were taught to either hate, and like I said, strong words, sometimes we push it aside because it seems so strong, or maybe distrust. And in your home, you grew up hearing this and communicated to you, and, and maybe you really never asked the question, why do we think that about these people? but yet you grew up believing it without any question. If that happened in your home, you will understand why James and John have such an issue here. Because they have been taught since they were a child, these Samaritans are not pure, they're not like us, you can't trust them, ultimately it comes down to we hate them. Now, last week we, we talked about a story that Jesus had told me, we, we know it, it's called the good, what? Good Samaritan. And so what Jesus is teaching a story, the Samaritan is the hero. The Samaritan who is the one who helps the Jew who is in distress and in need. So what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples, he's trying to change the way that they view Samaritans. But James and John are in Samaria, are Samaria and they are ready to call down fire from heaven. Well, let's look at verse 51. Verse 51, it says, as the time drew near for him to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Now, most scholars say that verse 51 in chapter 9 of Luke is a turning point in the whole gospel of Luke. The first nine chapters up until this verse is all about Jesus coming. It's, it's about him being born of a virgin. It's about his, pro, his fulfilling prophecy. It's about miracles. It's about teaching. And what it is is that he's establishing the fact that, yes, I am the Messiah. I am the one that you've been looking for. I am the promise of God. All of that is happening up till chapter 9, verse 51, and then Luke turns the corner. And he says that Jesus, that he resolutely, actually it's translated differently, that Jesus set his jaw like a flint to go to Jerusalem. So what really is happening is that the story is turned. Jesus has established, this is who I am. And now, starting in verse 51, he's saying, and my goal and my purpose is to go to the cross, to die on the, sin, to die on the cross for the sins of humanity, to rise again on the third day, and one day to come back. And there is nothing that will stop Jesus from fulfilling that mission and that command, that directive that God has given him because he loved us so much that he was willing to die for us. So, so, it, so it turns at that point, and what we find is, is that now Jesus is calling people to be true disciples. Don't just, don't just follow me because of my miracles. Don't just follow me for what you can get out of it, which is what's been happening up until this point. But Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, then you've got to be committed to the cause. Actually, right after what we just read, there'll be three people who will come up to Jesus and say, I'm going to follow you. And Jesus will say, you've got to leave your family. You've got to leave your past. You've got to leave everything behind if you are going to follow me because this is not going to be an easy journey. So everything is changing and he heads to the Samaritan village. Let's kind of go back to verse 52. And it says he went there to prepare for his arrival. He's going to spend some time there. But the people in the village did not welcome Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem. He was going to the place the Jews believed was the true place of worship. The Samaritans believed it was on this Mount Garrison, and that was the true place to worship. And so it says they did not accept him. And when James and John saw this, they wanted to defend Jesus and bring down fire from heaven and burn the whole place up. So where did they get this idea? Well, Peter, James, and John had a, had a very unique experience that happens in Luke chapter 9. And they are allowed to go with Jesus up on a mountain in what we know as the Mount of Transfiguration. And when, when they go up there with Jesus, all of a sudden a supernatural event takes place. And Jesus is standing there with Moses and the prophet Elijah. 
He's having conversation with them. Peter says, we need to build a tent. we got to stay. This is, this is an amazing place. And Jesus says, no, not, not going to happen. And then God puts his blessing on Jesus. Says, this, is, this is the one that you've been looking for. So Peter, James, and John come off of that mountaintop experience. They've stood there with the prophet Elijah, and when they say we should bring down fire from heaven to burn them up, what they're really doing is they're quoting a a, a story or an experience that Elijah had. So this is the great prophet Elijah, and in 2 Kings, first chapter, I'll read to you one verse of it. It says, Elijah replied to a captain. So an army has come to take Elijah. And he replies to the captain, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and destroy you and your 50 men. And then fire fell from heaven and killed them all. Now, if you read the rest of the story, it says, Then then the king sent another captain and 50 men, and the same thing happened. He said, I am a man of God, and fire from heaven comes down, burns the second group up. The third group shows up, has heard about this twice, and the captain falls on his face in front of Elijah and says, Please don't burn us up. So, So James and John knew the story. They knew the power that Elijah had. They've had an experience with Elijah. So they're looking to the scriptures, looking to their history, and say, if Elijah can pull down fire from heaven, we can bring down fire from heaven. And ultimately, what they were doing was using the scriptures to impose their own will to be accomplished. The scriptures were in their head, but they had hatred in their heart. It's interesting sometimes, well, here's what I have experienced as a pastor. When someone is really angry, a believer, a follower of Christ, and they get really angry and they get mad and they lose it, and and a conversation may ensue or follow, oftentimes this is what is quoted. Well, you know what? Jesus got angry. Don't you remember that time he went in the temple and he started throwing tables over? Everybody remember that? So all of a sudden, we use this scripture to justify our outburst. Well, Jesus got angry, and you're exactly right. Jesus did get angry. He got angry because of what was going on in God's house. But there are rare occasions when Jesus gets angry. He ultimately is trusting God in the midst of all of this. But we try to sometimes justify our behavior based on what we want scripture to say to us. I I like what this hymn writer, George Matheson, says. He says, There are times when I do well to to be angry, but I often mistake those times. Can you relate? So these guys, they're saying, we want to defend you, Jesus. These people don't need to talk like that to you. They don't need to act like these are Samaritans. We hate these people. We're going to defend you, Jesus. But the truth is, God doesn't need us to defend him. We have to get that in our head. God is so great and so mighty, if he can create the heavens and the earth and the universe and do anything, anything he wants, he doesn't need us to defend him. What, what he ultimately needs us to do is represent him. We don't need to defend him, we need to represent him. And the best way to defend Jesus, this is what he would teach us, the best way to defend Jesus is to live like him. To live in a world that is angry and frustrated and full of hatred and full of dissent and all sorts of things going in our society right now, the best way to defend Jesus is to look, to live like him. All right, so in verse 55 and 56, if you look at it in the King James Version, I've given you the New Living, but in the, in the King James Version, there's some, there's some additional words that Jesus says. It says, but he turned and he rebuked James and John, and he said, you don't know what matter of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So Jesus teaches us a few things. He teaches us how to respond and how to handle times of hatred and bitterness and anger. The first thing it says, he turned to James and John and he rebuked them. Guys, what are you doing? 
why are you saying this? This is not right. You are not supposed to go down that direction of wanting to bring down fire from heaven. And he ultimately rebukes them. And Jesus teaches us something, and man, is it hard to do. Jesus teaches us that hatred must be confronted. James and John, I love you enough to tell you the truth. I love you enough to tell you the truth that this response that you have had is not what God would want for you. He rebuked them. And there's another thing. It says, he says to them, he said, James and John, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of. And I think the best translation I could come up to is to say, guys, you don't know what kind of attitude you are portraying in this moment. Your attitude is wrong. And he confronted them about their attitude. You see, they had a great memory about the past, but they had a bad motive in the way that they wanted to approach things. Parents, have you ever said this, this phrase to your kids? You need an attitude what? Adjustment. You need an attitude adjustment. I'm sure you probably had that said to you a time or two. So what Jesus is saying to them is, guys, you need an attitude adjustment. This is not the way that we are to look at God's creation. These Samar- Even though they're Samaritans, you need an attitude adjustment. Now, here's the, here's the interesting thing about attitude. Attitude is something all of us have control over. But oftentimes, we let other people control our attitude. So what was happening with James and John is that these these hated Samaritans were not responding as they should. Their attitude got out of whack. They got angry. They even had hatred coming out. But it was their attitude that needed to change. And here's, here's the challenge for us, folks. We don't need to give anyone the right in our life to control our attitude. We don't need to give anyone the authority or the power in our lives, in our interactions to control the way we are going to respond to them. We, through the power of the Spirit, can have control over our attitude. Well, this is what Charles Swindoll says. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. He says, I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. So let's make it personal. Anybody in your circles right now? that you have allowed to control your attitude. Anybody in your circles right now that you have given the power to control your attitude and it's turned into hatred or bitterness or resentment? Jesus says to his disciples, hey guys, this is not the right attitude. The spirit that you have is not what God would want for you. Here's the last phrase. He says, for the son of man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save it. Jesus will not only say this here, he'll say it multiple other times. And here's what I think he's saying to James and John and passing along to us. Do not let your prejudice blind you to God's purposes. Do not let your prejudice, James and John, over these people to blind you to God's purposes. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. And then in John 17, right after that, he says, The Son did not come into the world to condemn the world, but rather to save it. So what Jesus is saying is that your Hatred has blinded you, James and John, to what I want to do, what God's purpose is, For these people you hate. What what he's trying to tell them, and a little bit goes with the scene that you saw at first, Jesus is trying to teach them that ultimately we are here as disciples of Christ, we are here as his followers to plant seeds of grace, to build bridges of love. This is ultimately our goal and our purpose as his followers, and God has a plan and purpose for all people. 
Have you noticed, let's just be transparent for him. Have you noticed the first time you meet somebody, you size them up? First time you meet them, you, you, you begin to size them up. You begin to make determinations about them. It could be based on the way they speak. It could be based on the way that they dress. It could be based on the color of their skin. You, you name it, you and I all of a sudden begin to size people up based on what we see. What Jesus is trying to teach his disciples, what he's trying to teach us today, is that whenever you see someone, Whoever they are, no matter their background, no matter what you understand about them, like or dislike, every person, we are told, are made in the image of God. They are created in the image of God, and God has a plan and a purpose for their life. That may mean that they may be living it, they may not, they may be resistant to it, they may be embracing it. We don't know, but God's purpose is for all people that they would come to know him, that they are loved by him. There is no one outside of the boundaries of his love. And he's saying to James and John, and he's saying to us, do not allow your prejudice to stand in the way of God's purposes. Pretty strong message. I like how the chosen presents it. I think they do a better job than even what we've talked about here. So let's watch this scene with James and John about the scripture we just read. Rabbi. Well, you couldn't wait, could you? We're sorry, we just uh, wanted to clear a few things up, if that's okay. By all means. You Jewish boys are far from home. Yes, as a matter of fact, we are. Shalom to you too. Here's our traditional Jewish greeting for you. Don't lift a finger. That was a warning. Try it again and see what happens. Quiet, Big James. Shalom to you, too. Oh, you filthy dogs! I said quiet. Let us do something. What would that achieve? Defending your honor. They reviled and humiliated you. They deserve to have bolts of lightning rain down and incinerate them. Yes, fire from the heavens. Fire? You said we could do things like that. Say the word and it will happen. Why not? We knew we couldn't trust these people. We shouldn't have come here in the first place. They don't deserve you. Why do you think I had you work, Melek's field? What was I trying to teach you? To help? You think it was just to be more helpful? Or to be better farmers? It was to show you that what we're doing here will last for generations. What I told Fotina at the well, and what she then told so many others, it's sowing seeds that will have a lasting impact for lifetimes. Can you not see what's happening here? These people that you hate so much are believing in me without even seeing miracles. It's the message, the truth that we're giving them. And you're going to get in the way of that because a few people from a region you don't like were mean to you. That they're not worthy? What, you're so much better? You're more worthy? Well, let me tell you something. You're not. That's the whole point. It's why I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Rabbi. As we gather others, I need you to help show the way. To be humble. We will. You wanted to use the power of God to bring down fire, to burn these people up? Well, it sounds a lot worse when you say it that way. <laughs> you too. You're like a storm on the sea. Thunder exploding out of your chests at every turn. <laughs> In fact, that's what I'm going to call you from now on. James and John, the sons of thunder. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Today, 
it was not good. But strong passion can be a good thing when channeled for righteousness. I just may have to delay giving you that authority we discussed earlier, or in smaller doses, until you two calm down a bit. <laughs> James, John, you look terrible. What happened? What happened is that James and John needed to be reminded we're here in Samaria to plant seeds, not to burn bridges. Well, what happened to James and John? Let me read to you two scriptures as we close. So now the church has been established. Jesus resurrected. The Holy Spirit has come. In Acts chapter 12, it says, and about that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some of the believers in the church. And he had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. And when Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This is the James that Jesus said, hey, we're here to build bridges. James, it says, was, this is what church tradition says. That James was so passionate about following Jesus that on the day that they took him to be beheaded for his faith, the one who would take him to his execution, James was so passionate about Jesus that he led that man to become a follower of Christ and that man died beside him when he gave up his life and his faith for Christ. What happened to John, that son of thunder? What well, says in, in Acts chapter 8, Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them, the Samaritans, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Peter and John laid hands on these Samaritans and they received the Holy Spirit. The very people that John, just a few years before, said, bring down fire from heaven. Right now he's laying hands on them that they would receive the power of the Holy Spirit. John goes on to write, probably one of the most famous Gospels, the characteristic of the Gospel of John is one word, love. It's from beginning to end, it's all about love. John is called the disciple, he calls himself this, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He is the beloved disciple. And then he ends his life on exile on the island of Patmos, getting revelation from God and writing down that last book of our Bible, the book of Revelation. Those two guys that stood outside a village and said, burn them all up, we hate them, have been so transformed by the power of the gospel that they become messengers of love and transformation to the very people that they once hated. Now here's what I gather from that. There is power in the name of Jesus to soften the most hated hatred in our hearts. There's power in the name of Jesus to transform us. No matter what we grew up with, no matter what we've been told, no matter what we've developed, no matter even what we go through, we still can be his disciples of love. So I want to pray for us as we close. And here's my prayer for you. You pray it for me. Is that we would be open to the power of God in our life to help us love those who are unlovable. That we would be open to the power of God in our life to the point that we would say, Jesus, I need to change my attitude. My hatred and my anger is taking away my joy. And I want to be a witness for you. So would you stand with me, please, and let's pray together. I really want you to make this prayer personal. So over the last 30 minutes, as we've read the scripture and we've talked about it, 
who's come to your mind? Who, who is that person or individuals or group of people that you're really struggling with? And as I pray, would you pray and ask the Lord that you would find healing, forgiveness, deliverance, and empowerment. Father, once again, your word has become alive to us. It's practical for where we live today. And Father, it, I think every day of our lives and every day of my life, Lord, I'm reminded we live in a broken world. And because of the brokenness of sin, there's hatred and discord and difficulty and bitterness and hurt. But Father, we want to live above that. And so I, I'm praying right now, Father, for myself and for my, my brothers and sisters here and those who are online, that, Lord, that we would just surrender that hurt and pain and indifference and bitterness, that we would just give it to you. And right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray that, that you would empower us, that you'd change us, that you'd strengthen us, and that you'd help us that every person we see, we would recognize they are loved by you. Father, no doubt when we leave this sanctuary, we're going to have encounters this week. And it is my prayer that the Holy Spirit that transformed James and John will be the same Holy Spirit that empowers us to live and be a light in dark places. Thank you for our Savior Jesus, who has done so much that we could be free from sin and empowered to live the life of joy and peace and love that he wants for us. We rest in that. It's in the name of Jesus I ask this. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for being in worship today. Grab a book when you go out. Spend daily time learning more about Jesus and his plans for you. So may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. And may you be a testimony of his love this week. God bless you. Thanks for being in worship today.